several things um, just wanted to this is kind of a, a or just kind of put it on the table to the site authority folks um, for a kind of an update on the reserve funds that are moving to the Wells Fargo accounts this was on the 5th of, at the last uh, site authority meeting it was voted that that our reserves would be put into or that UG Cam's reserves would be put into um, accounts FDIC um, insured and and cascaded however the foundation does it and so that was something that came up at the, um, the December 5th site authority meeting that was voted um, uh, in the affirmative and so just kind of keeping track of that as far as is there a schedule or you know what what the procedure is and what realistically you know if you come back and say it's July 15th or something like that or the beginning of the next fiscal year or is there a, a um, time frame for that? That's a question. That's a good question. Let me find out if I can get an answer while we're here. Okay. okay I'll move we on. haven't had a conversation. Um, just just for people's information, um, this year, this last month, we got a gas bill for the pools that was um, comparative, and it was interesting. It was for the small pool, was the highest bill. Um, and this is the townside pool. Last year, the bill was two thousand eighty-seven dollars and eighty-nine cents, which is kind of in line for the for seasonal temperatures. Um, but the bill actually came back at three thousand forty-five dollars and eighty-one cents, which is a forty-five percent increase. And so we talked among ourselves, and so in consultation with Mission Hills, we decided that we would turn off the heat to the small pool because it seems to be the largest, the biggest culprit. And we'll leave the spa on there until April April 1st, and then we'll look at turning the pool back on, the small pool. And just for your information, the Hillcrest pool, which is a larger pool, um, in um, a year ago, the bill was $1,743.63, and this year it was $2,271, which is a 30% increase. But it's a larger pool, and and so we are also looking um, a little more further or more into it 
to see whether this is an equipment issue, you know, whether there or, or what exactly um, may be no options. Rate, no rate increases? Um, none, none that were, you know, we would have expected because, uh, because, because in our December bill was in the $1,500, $1,800 range, which is what we expected, right. and then this jumped up to, you know, $3,000. Mine was very high. Uh -huh. gas. Gas uh, solar heating. I had my pool in the summer. Solar mm -hmm. heating. So, so we we really wonder if heaters are getting towards end of life. They're coming up on the reserve study for replacements, and if whether or not there's new technology that might be less of an energy consumer also. So, kind of we we raised broader questions as we were discussing this in the And so we did we did send out an e-blast to everyone and we have heard back from people who say they use the pool and I don't doubt doubt that they do. Um, you know, inconvenience and we apologize for the inconvenience, you know, but at the same time from a from a monetary standpoint, um, this seemed like the prudent thing to do. Of course we're working with better pools to get both one pool on and one pool off, but that's another issue. The bond. Yeah. There's no chance of a meter issue. There could be several things. I I just need to get with with better pools. You know, one thing I can tell you, Jake, is yeah. that being that I swim in the wintertime, mm -hmm. last year you had the uh, I swim in the big pool. Right. right. Last year you had the big pool about four or five degrees cooler than this year. Okay. So I don't know who made a decision to raise it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's like 78 or so for the last like since winter started here. Well, that's where that's where it always been was 79. Definitely like four or five degrees hotter this this uh, winter. Okay. So that may be some of your your gas thing. Yeah. And marginal. A lot of people don't want to get in when it's like 72 to 73. I got some more. A lot of us don't want to get in unless it's 85, 88. <laughs> okay, so that, so everybody's kind of aware of that and that we're watching it, so it isn't a, a surprise. Um, the next thing, um, we're working on the UGCAM budget, which is due on Friday next a week from tomorrow. And um, the operations part of it um, is, is is pretty straightforward. We're looking at adding a contingency into the operations part um, and um, discuss what that is. The and as far as the I'll back a little bit and then as far as the reserves are concerned, that we have completed a level three um, reserve study for the common areas, the townhouses, and the single families. And those those reserve studies are. Uh, Level three is basically an updating of the level one we did last year, so it's considerably less expensive and um, brings things kind of up to date. We did meet with the um, with the um, reserve people, and and they produced the initial reports on December twelfth, and then we've had subsequent conversations with them as well to hone that in a little further. So we're working we're working on that. Um, we, the common area and the single family reserves are um, more balanced and um, <laughs> easily explained. The townhomes um, are, the townhome reserves are a concern. Um, the, the most recent, um, the level three came back that it's a 50, 57% um, funded. So it's down from last year at 61%. So we're looking into that further. Um, one of the things that we, we do realize that the three items, which are big ticket items, are long, long term kind of ticket items for the townhomes are the roofs, the heaters. The roofs are normal, um, what you would expect. Because of the ground sublease, there are two additional obligations. One is the heaters, and the other are the windows. And so what we're looking at is in the um, reserve portion of the budget is to list those things that are in the reserve studies like we did this year. And then we're looking at having a contingency that we have an idea how much money we spent on 
several things. One is on windows, another is on slab leaks in the townhouses. This is all um, specific to, this, to the townhouses, which we have responsibility for the ground sites. And so we're trying to get a better handle on that and, and be clearer. The other thing that, that has come up as well, which we will put um, in the budget, is the um, regarding the irrigation, um, having to do with that this year, the repairs of the irrigation are being done by the university's um, technician, and um, that's what our agreement is. Um, we are discovering that um, there's kind of a hole in the service in that we do not have anybody troubleshooting um, on a regular basis to know whether there are things that are broken that you can you can troubleshoot it. And so we are in, con in conversation with the site authority and personnel and, and uh, Lori and Rosa about how we address that. And um, from a monetary standpoint in the budget, we anticipate putting the, the um, repairs which is the $30,000 that the university told us that would be the number. We would put that in the operations portion, and then depending on how we, what we come up with for the, um, the troubleshooting of the irrigation, however that may be a combination of Brightview and um, university, or totally university or whatever, um, the university had given us a price, facilities, a price of $80,000, which is one person. Um, to do the entire package, and so I'm going to put the $50,000 differential as a contingency in the reserves, so it is captured someplace, so that, um, because we aren't going to, um, it'll be in the initial um, how do you say, rendition of the um, budget, so that we address it as far as how we're going to move forward with the um, irrigation um, troubleshooting as well as um, the follow-up. And I am getting prices from the um, Brightview for both of those items. So it's like that we can we can kind of compare. And so um, we're, we're working on that. I think this is something that um, the entire team is working on. Which brings us to the landscape refurbishing project. We have received the four bids back from the um, RFP that we put out. Um, we got it back on Friday the 17th. There, are, there were four bidders, and um, we're, we're looking at that. I'm not, it, they are above what our budget number is, and so we're working, all of us, with the Landscape Committee from the HAC as well as the site personnel, and I had a, con I had a brief conversation with um, Brightview this afternoon and looking at how we can figure out our way forward, whether we add to the budget or we go by the budget and, and reduce the services, and how we make that all fit and what we could possibly get done by the end of the year um, within the budgetary uh, amount that we have now. So all of them, it's a lot of um, kind of moving parts on it, and um, we should have, have more. But the most the important moving part, say this now and not say it later, um, the most important moving part, not one new plant can go in the ground until we can be assured that there will be water to keep that plant alive and that our plant guarantee from Brightview is in force. Because I can't recommend to the site authority that we spend $500,000, which is the budgeted amount for refurbishing, on refurbishing if we're going to do it and kill it. So. <laughs> and it's logical. <laughs> well, well, of yes, no. and, that also and I have never had anything kill the biological blocker. Well, and that. You are very fortunate. No, I think many people on the street feel the very same way. Jake, can I ask a question? Sure. On the Twin Harbor, no. or in the Channel Islands, mm -hmm. there's a house where. Yeah, I know what it okay, is. Okay, yeah. so was that, uh, I think it looks nicer than what's out there, right? but is that sanctioned by, did they? They did that, they did that front part on their own, okay, and then the DG behind that, that was mud okay. that, that I authorized putting the DG in because it was, it was a mud pit. Okay. And so that is something that we can talk further about, you know, from, from the standpoint of, 
that was done on their own. Okay, but then that, that goes against, like, like everyone kind of holds back of taking out dead plants because you're not supposed to remove or replace plants. But, and I'm not condemning them for doing this because sure. I think it looks better than, I, I'm mm -hmm. actually supportive of it. But how do we reconcile that? With the people taking in their own hands of landscaping their own, in front of their own house because they're not happy with maybe waiting for something to happen. Well, how I would look at it is that with the refurbishing, we will address that during the refurbishing. Because that, you know, yes, it looks nice, but it's like that isn't that isn't in a con continuous or or same aesthetic throughout the entire community, and and so that is something that yes, we all need to address, you know, and in that sense, they've done it, mm -hmm. and it started out with a few succulents, and then it grows, you know, kind of thing. And um, and then there were some health issues with the, with the mud and the bees right. and you know so so it was addressing very specific specific items. Right. But you that doesn't don't mean want everyone to, to to go off on their own tangent we do, while yeah. assuming that something is going to happen sooner than later. But like Sandy said, not until we have something in place that there's they're going to be irrigation and and enough water like to replace water the and not plants. and not exceeding. I would kind of vote for. It not exceeding the money that we have. I think we really need to look, stay within the budget, and I think that with some, you know, I'm not on the landscape committee, but I'm sure that people are on there have some good input as far as ways to save money. And like, I think I brought it up a couple of years ago, and we have a different crew here, is um, using, you know, river rock, using that rock, like just like they do at the beach, as opposed to you know, we were pushing so hard for all this time of, hey, we're not getting our um, our bark like everybody else, right. and then come to find out that it's a hazard. So I'm like, for the long term, maybe it's a little, that's maybe a little more money up front with, with the rock, but less plants, you know, and less care in the long run. So are, I would are, these, are these things that get discussed at the AKC meeting? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, yeah. these are points I'm all thinking, but yes, they are. I just want to make, yeah, I, yeah, I think. As a matter of fact, the, the water issue is one of the issues the HAC asked me to bring okay. because we have a, a facilities community right. conversation. Yeah, and I, and I, I want to let Dave finish his report, but right. I have some questions about that too, but, but yeah. go ahead. Okay, the next item is that we have received back the regarding the top lot replacement project. We had sixty-five. We have sixty-five thousand dollars in the budget this year, and the prices that came back. There were two of them. There were more that were asked to bid, and two came back, and they're both right around one hundred twenty-five thousand to two uh, one hundred thirty thousand. So it's about double what we have budgeted, and you know, I mean, we're open. We really haven't spent a good deal of time on it outside of that. Now we have some prices. We could get out for more bids. We could also say, do we reduce the scope? Or, you know, there, there are various options, but we haven't dug into that one now that we've kind of confirmed that um, it doesn't match what we have in reserves for the year. Okay, the last item that I have is that there have been um, dog excrement. There is much. There is lots of discussion about it, and at the last HAC meeting, there was there were two apartment dwellers that were very emphatic, and one was a young mother, particularly in regard to the top lot, and she was commenting that it, you know, it clearly says no dogs in the top lot, and um, there's dog equipment in the top lot, and so they were suggesting that. Um, we, as the manager, send out a specific e-blast, just not, you know, the monthly e-blast that sh that discusses, you know, leash laws and and ground sublease requirements and that kind of thing. Um, be more specific. And she was suggesting that um, health hazards, it, it, the health hazards to toddlers, particularly, and and those implications. I haven't done the research on that, but that is something that um, we're looking at doing in the next several weeks. So those are kind of, those are the highlights of what I've got going on. Thank you. Does anybody have any other questions? Okay. Oh, 
one, the only question I have is, you know, when, when we when we had the when the ir irrigation maintenance, and I thought it was maintenance that was being separated from the landscape maintenance program. Am I correct in that? Or when 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 the site authority or, or facilities t remain responsible for irrigation, on what basis? I mean, I guess I'm, I'm trying to understand. Um, I'm gonna be able to help. Okay. Uh, I wanted to jump in and make this a good place. I wanna compliment Sergio very much. Okay. He helped me with my particular situation. And in the conversation, you know, he was describing how there's the buried lines with the pop-up head, right? And they're intended more for lawns. So they're underground 18 inches or something. And one interpretation is that's owned by the site authority because it's underground and expected to fiddle with. And then there's the drifts on top, which can relatively easily be moved around and reconfigured depending on what you're doing. So one idea could be that you determine that the underground system is the site authority, but the lands but the drift system on the top can be managed by Brightview or whoever is doing landscaping. So they're sure to get the water where they need it to survive the plant. And then maybe so it's just an idea. Well, so, the so I, Chris, I, I think it's more complicated than that. Okay. My understanding from a budgetary point of view of where we were last year is that facilities wanted to remain in control of the irrigation system because it's an expensive system, uh, it's electronic controls are somewhat complicated, and they wanted to protect that investment because the investment supports both east and west campuses. So they wanted to remain in control. The difficulty is their 80,000 was so much more than what we got back in the bids for our new landscaping contractor but that caused a great deal of heartburn, both for Kennedy Wilson and for us okay. uh, as a group. I, I so so I, that's I, kind I, of, yeah, so, so, so things got kind of split and the university maintained control of doing the repairs, but there's no one doing the proactive work of figuring out right. whether the system is working. Right. See, and I, so, I, I, I'm hearing different. Um, we've had conversations with Jason and Sergio, and uh, Sergio says he is out there on a regular basis doing review, not just fixing, because you know he's he's you know out there on at least a part-time basis. So he's out there 20 hours a week, because and that's what we're getting back. So are we not seeing him so, or okay? No. That that isn't. That is wasn't our understanding. Okay. That, I mean, that is actually because, not what they said in the meeting last Friday. Oh, that's what it was. Okay. Okay, so my understanding from the meeting mm -hmm. and watching the interactions, I mean, Jake was holding a meeting to do something that I thought was really important, which was to improve the communication right. between facilities in Brightview. Right, and this is where you went out and looked at properties. Right. Right. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. okay, so that's good. And I misunderstood what Rosa shared with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was last, Can you, well, well, and, and, and this was, what this had to do with the, the little bit of detail, it was like a modification we had a request from a townhouse owner to remove the land, the rosemary at the front of his house. Okay, he wanted this because of the as as a young a, a young one that likes to play in the grass, and you know it's kind of an area that isn't available for play. Okay, we'll entertain it. So we we put in the work order, and and it had to do with that we would have to make a modification to the to the um, planter irrigation because the saw gets water twice a week and the planter gets water once a week. Okay, so we had the meeting about that. Could this be done? Well, yes, it could be done. It's a cost issue whether we can do it or not, but it brought, it brought up that that went, that there was no one that was actively testing the system. And that's- okay, that, testing the system. The, the testing the okay. system. Okay. And where this comes is that, that in the past, there was a technician that they that we were that that uh, East Campus owners were paying for, which was a, a full time person. Okay, and our understanding when we were putting the budget together last year was okay. How much is that? So we asked, and they said eighty thousand. And we go, whoa, 
And at that point, we, because we had the new contractor coming, we said, so if you would do the repairs, because usually in contract, and usually in, in contracts, you can ask for the repairs and you can do service, you know, it's like, usually you would give that to your contractor, okay? As part of the bid sheet, we had a repair number in. All the five bidders put a repair number in. And that ended up being half of what um, the university was saying, 30,000. And so at that point, there was, there were, this was last summer when everything was kind of shifting. And so it was like that point, we just stopped talking about it a little bit because, because in the past, some of these, some of these differentials showed up in what I was going to say, Tom, huh, that we, when we were in, when the VA bag meeting was that we discovered that it was being taken out of reserves in that, that we had not seen before. And so at that point, we, we kind of went with the low number. And now we're resolving what was not resolved last summer. So I get the real question I was asking, and I think it's been answered, is that it, apparently it wasn't very well defined who was going to, where the, where the line of demarcation went between the two. And because I would have, like you guys, assumed that if somebody was going to be responsible for the irrigation, that they would be testing and making sure there's no leaks and things like that. It's a difficult thing to do. It's a very difficult thing to have two different contractors maintaining things that are very interrelated with each other. I understand the need or the desire, but um, but it sounds like we need to, to, well, I think you're doing that, but I understand you're doing the right I mean, thing here. I mean, we're, we're walking down a path to improve yeah. the conversation, right. but we absolutely have to have a way to know by proactive testing that water is yeah. being delivered to a particular well, geography. And all I'm saying is I manage a lot of properties and that's an expectation that I have of my landscape crew is that that's part of when they say we take care of the irrigation, I assume it means that. And I think it was safe to assume that the uh, facilities meant that too. And, and Sergio said uh, he's not doing testing. That's what they said on my from, from my my impression is that we when there are broken lines we hear about them, we put them in into his ear, okay. and, he that, and then he repairs it. So, and it as opposed to it. Correct, okay. correct. Okay. And, and in the past, when we've talked about it, they said, you know, that's what the addition, that's a full-time person, you're paying for a, for a part-time person. Okay. So can I ask you something, Lori? Yeah. Um, do you, I, I don't, I, I understand the need for, or the desire for the university to control the, the water system, mm -hmm. but, Is there a way for for the landscape crew to take a, a bigger role in that and then somehow provide reports or do something that might satisfy that? Because if you can get somebody else to do it for $30,000, it, you know, it's... it's Absolutely, it's, and I, I think that's the conversation that we're having. And, and historically, what had occurred is that we didn't have control of it. Um, going back to the previous, Brightview had it long before the campus, so when we took it over, it was in serious disarray. It was very poorly done. We upgraded the whole system, invested a, a big chunk of money into that. And I think the concern when we started to break this apart is what we don't want to have happen is to go back to its previous. So I would say this year was a bit of a test for us as well. I, I, would, I think it was you know kind of a, plus we had a lot of changes right around that same time, um, weren't part of the conversation until after the fact, and so is there opportunity? Absolutely, we're, we're talking about it on a pretty good basis. I do know, I, I mean, I fully yeah. appreciate how important that is. If you're gonna spend money to real landscape, you, you need to know. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I go through this in my properties where uh, you get you get into this with roofers and air conditioning guys. When a roof leaks, mm. the roofer says it's the air conditioner <laughs> guy who did it, and the air conditioning all handled. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say uh, a good word to Ralph Brightview. I remember when I turned a certain age, I had a birthday party, a very big one. And in front of my house, there was no grass. I planted grass seed and watered and watered, and I did this, that, and the other. I see a terrific improvement. And, and the next review has to be, are the plants drought tolerant? Oh, sure. Okay. Okay. So, as much as we can. One, one, and one last comment. The microgeography of zones may not match the microgeography of the new planting. Right. 
So that was like a so, so so for example when you're talking I about this one have, you're yeah. talking uh, Mary, you're talking about the woman who planted something different there mm -hmm. it may be that the zone that that is on if somebody wants sod or something else on the same zone they you just can't do that on the same zone one of them's going to suffer and um, so you do that's what part of a landscape uh, management program and a landscape architect mm -hmm. does is you you plant and you design your irrigation zones to be consistent with the kind of planning. You do different planning on different, where the sun's different, different sides of the building. You have your irrigation zone set up differently, and you have to. And that's why it's, that's why our cost is getting to what it's getting to be. That's why the five hundred thousand dollars isn't sufficient. I understand that because we're talking about making some big changes. But anyway, I only wanted to draw attention to the fact that I, I can see that there is. That, that issue, and, I, and I'm not surprised, but the issue of one one party maintaining the irrigation and another party being responsible for the planning is is a difficult one, and probably going to have to have some effort to resolve it. Okay. Yeah, I'm not predicting the outcome, but well, yeah, I mean, the site authority could go to hear the audit of the irrigation system. Okay? Exactly, and we've talked about. Give it over to that. Brightview at half the cost to maintain. Right. They know what they're doing. They can work on the whole. A year, site authority does an audit on the control boxes, the you know, the Wi-Fi, and everything else. Yeah, like it might that. be helpful to identify what it is specifically that the site authority, the facilities, is concerned with, because I know that they they probably not they're not thinking like we are downstream, like you're you're going to plant this and it's costing a lot of money. And, and they see the water bill yeah. every month, so oh, if yeah. all of a sudden it's jacked up, you know, they'll right. say, hey, East right. Campus, I don't know what you guys doing here. Right. You know, and they have a meeting. Do, do, has there been a meeting between Brightview and facilities to talk just about that? This was kind of what this meant. This was the first <laughs> one. <laughs> meeting one has happened. Okay, good. good. Well, that's great. That's great. Yeah. yeah. And everybody and everybody was there too. Yeah. So it was yeah. six of them. Were, everyone was introduced to each other. I mean, I, just to reiterate, I view this group as not so much to deal with the little problems, but to find how to resolve the things that are kind of standing in the way of making progress and that seems to me to be one of them yeah. so just encouraging that those conversations take place okay so, um, anything else um, if you're done I'll go back to your first question Stephanie wrote back and said all of the paperwork has been submitted uh, we had sit, had to submit additional forms and we are looking toward transferring funds next week <laughs> and then she said all I can say is it's a process <laughs> and a smiling face. No, no, face. But, but this is to be cheered. Yeah, yeah. This is to be cheered. Yeah, Reserve right. funds and insured accounts is definitely to be yeah, cheered. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's and I knew she had been working on it, but I didn't want to speak to where it was. So, okay. So okay, then I think it's your turn, Sandy. Okay, so we've discussed one of my items. I only have one left. And that is our HSC Rules Committee. I'm deciding people that they are. Two of them here in the room with us. Three of them. Three of them in the room. That's yeah. true. Four. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> so the whole the committee. <laughs> the committee is here. The committee is here. We have a four. So, so, guys, if I don't say this right, please speak up. They're working on pool rules, and they have begun with a very reasonable thing of looking at the Mission Hills, the Mission's rules the ground sublease rules, other community rules that we had lying around about pools. And they've done a comparison and mostly things are in agreement. There are a few variances, they're discussing those. But as they're working through pool issues, one of the issues is that we occasionally have incidents at the pool, something happens and somebody needs to figure out what happened and whether or not someone needs to be cited for what happened in some way or another. So they're proposing that we create a combined committee of an ENS ring representative, a resident of Mission Hills Apartments, a HSC member, and an owner from University Blend. And, and Jake. And, and Jake, oh, Jake has <laughs> and Jake, come too. Oh. Oh. If he wants to. <laughs> well, if he wants to. You're so close. <laughs> So I have a question. How do you how do you feel about having a, one of your your tenants be a participant in, in, in that? 
I don't know. I, I don't understand. This is the first I'm hearing about a oh, okay. committee, but I don't know why we need a committee to decide if somebody violates the rules. If they violate the rules, they send a lease violation the same day it happens, and we don't have to vote on it. It's clear they violated. It affects their lease. They get a violation letter. The committee Good is to review the fog and the camera footage and the fog data. I can do that. I do do that. Okay. I'm we not supposed that. to talk, so I'm not going to talk. <laughs> <laughs> that's well, private. I mean, that's kind of not open for public view. Right. Cameras are not something that people are comfortable having open for public view. That's why it would be a committee with the HAC. So let me just ask a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. If the person that you see um, causing the problem at the pool is not a resident of the apartments, but is instead a University Glen resident, I tell Jake. Um, I tell Jake. He writes a letter. Is that working right now? Mm -hmm. It did last summer. Okay. That something isn't working or you wouldn't be concerned about this. Well, so I think the committee's concerned because they don't think it's working because they don't think it's all being seen. So so is there a way that we can at least ask for I I don't know whether you do you, you do things I think frequently or Okay. Mm -hmm. Generally we review it when there's a complaint. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now the other the other thing that is also that is true, and we, I think, those of us that have been here for a while know that there there are kind of un, under underneath here is the conversation of that there are rules that are in the ground sublease that we have not been enforcing. For instance, uh, just one of them would be the inflatable toys in the pools. You know it. You know, it just doesn't happen. And so the question would be is, is it, is there community will or site authority will that everybody agrees, okay, for the summer season, it's coming up. And as of this, well, this is the underpinning that I'm hearing, that going forward, yes, these are the rules. And that this, these rules we're going to enforce. And so if we're going to enforce them, for instance, if they're inflatable toys, it also says no balls in the, in the, um, in the pool areas. You know, it's like, is there, is, is the implication that yes, we're going to address that. And if we're going to address it, we give fair warning that going forward, this is the way it's going to be. And what I hear in this conversation is, if we want to enforce that, and decide that we want to go enforce the rules that are by the ground sublease called out, and your lease says a lot of the same things. Mm -hmm. Like one of the things that the lease says, which the ground ground one of their lease, Mission Hills lease, that the ground sublease doesn't say is it says to have two two parties per household is what is allowed at the amenity. And you know, in the past, you whoever you could open the door and whoever walked in could come in. And so I think some of this conversation and the underlying current is, are, is there the political will among the community to, in, to say we are going to like, support the two, the two person rule? And that allows, in, and we understand the reasoning for it, is because that allows everybody equal access at any time. You know, that you don't have a big party of 20 people and everybody feels, well, I can't go in there because there are these, could be teenagers, it could be old folks, it could be young folks, whatever, that it is somebody else's pool and I can't, I don't have access to it. That, that is my sense of what the rules, what the rule, what the leasing office or the Mission Hills says, that's what that is there for. And so the question is, is that something that, as a community, we want to embrace and say, this is what we're going to do? And if we're going to do that, that, then the question would be is when somebody says, look, somebody had a toy, an uh, inflatable toy in the pool, that then we would look at, the, look at and see whether we could determine who it is. And sometimes you can, sometimes you can't, okay? 
but the question is, is that is that the direction that the community wants to go? Sandy, is this is this? So, so I guess kind of follow through. Um, I'm most concerned about the safety, real safety issues in the pool. So when I see someone walk in with a glass bottle, that concerns me. When I see a child walk in with a small inflatable toy, it's not likely to hurt anybody. Um, so, so I would see maybe as the rules committee does their their bidding on the HAC that they kind of address when it's important to go look at the tape. Um, and I I watched somebody bring food into the pool and it was being delivered being delivered to somebody who was sitting at the pool, who was sitting with a glass bottle of beer at the pool um, the last time I was there at the end of the summer. And so, okay, what should I do about this? Do I ignore, do I call somebody? Uh, I guess I could have called you. Um, Figure out the date, the time when you see it happening and report it to Jake or to me. Mm -hmm. We can look it up and see who it is okay. and address it. That is definitely a safety issue. Right. And we can take action at that point. Can we look but at the things that cost the interest of our CASA owners and the residents, department of them's money, like the broken glass bollards that are being broken, like in pillar fights and things like that. When those are broken and then get replaced by Brett, are we investigating how they got broken and, and finding them or charging them for this damage or instead of us incorporating this? Cost or absorbing this cost. We know who they, they get billed for. If I know who does it and I have evidence of what, who I it is, have, then I will bill them. Okay, but we should maybe have a separate meeting. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, okay. but, so but I think, I think, I think, think that's a good resolution. Right. We just, so the I, rules committee and and EMS ring need to sit down and. Well, you need to know that they need to be, since, since you both share the same pools, they need to be consistent with one another. And, uh, and I think and that's the goal and it sounds like enforcement is one of the things that you're asking about and th are there are, are, are there rules posted in the pool that would say all this yes. stuff yes okay. yes right. I think that since we have since you have the rules if any if any rule in there regardless of if it's an inflatable toy or a glass bottle everybody knows what the rules are and they're told I think before the summer it's reiterated if if I walk in there and I see somebody and they're violating one of the rules, I can then, if I, if I have that will to do it and decide it's offensive enough to me, or, no. you know, because you can have people overcoming the pool with all their inflatable toys, so that it is really supposed to be the pool for the enjoyment of everyone. Mm -hmm. So each individual neighbor has that right to report either to ENS Ring or to Jake if they can say, rather than just complaining about it, say this is the time that this rule violation occurred and then you investigate it and then it's up to you to find them, regardless of if it's uh, if they complain about it or not, they get the rule. Unless somebody goes, we go back and there's some discussion of like, well, there's this one part of it that is kind of, we want to change it, you know? I mean, I don't know if that would happen or not. But I'm going to think that because sometimes what will happen on next door, people will just complain. I saw this at the pool. I saw this at the pool. This one reasonable person, somebody, will usually say, "Did you report the time it happened?" Because it does no good if people, you know, then you're going to have these factions. There's a lot of people in the neighborhood with children. There's probably just as many without children. So, and, and we can't use it as the rationale of that they haven't been enforced so far. So that's a justification for not enforcing it. I'm thinking, like you're saying, if they are the rules, then if somebody reports it, then they need to be fined. But people are doing it, am I correct? I mean, some people are reporting it. Some people report it, and, and when it's reported, we and you're able to, uh, if somebody tells you what time it was in the day, you're able by the key clock to, to see who has right. access to it. Okay. Well, you know. We are a community. Yeah, and, and, and there are, sh and, and any time you share something with other people um, it's difficult and 
and some people are rule followers, and some people are very proud to not be rule followers. <laughs> I mean, they, then they brag about it. So I mean, that's, that's my one. neighbor. <laughs> yeah, I, have a neighbor. I have one too, I have so I understand. Oh, but that just go, unfortunately goes with the territory. But I, I do, I do support. I always, I've, I've always felt that this should at least emanate from the HAC, so that it really represents the needs of the, or what, the, what the well, community the wants, community. not what I want or what you know. Yeah. Now, as long as it's not contrary to, to something very logical. You know. but, but I think we need to, to mesh what we're doing yes, with what I agree. ADS I agree. is doing. So I, think that's great. Yeah. I think it's all resolved. Yeah. Well, Thank you. That, uh, that was the only okay. item okay. on my right. well, resolved. Can I add just one side note? Because you did say that people say that um, they complain about something and nothing happens about it. But there were at least three times last summer where things were called in very specifically, one person said there was a person with a baby in the spa wearing a diaper. And I went back and I looked that up and there was no baby, it was about a three, four year old in a bathing suit with their mother, not unsupervised, not contaminating the pool or the spa. And there was nothing for me to violate. So a person may have thought that they saw something like that happen, but in reality, that is not what happened, and so there was nothing for me to violate. And they might have felt like there was no action, but, and then there's also times when you do send a lease violation, you can't tell everybody you're sending a lease violation because it's private information. Yeah, so they saying. wouldn't know if a person did receive I, a violation. Um, I, so I don't, I guess that's my reaction. I don't know if I reported something, I wouldn't expect to hear something oh, like, <laughs> we, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, over. <laughs> we have to leave, um, Miriam, right behind you, the, the top button. Home, there you go. And Where then the there? same one on this one. Yeah. What is a lease violation? Um, anything that goes against the well, lease. How much policy. is a lease violation? Oh, we don't have fines. We just send a lease violation, first violation, second violation, third, you know, the former yeah. quit, and then we can kick people out if we have to, but that would take them to court and eviction. It's not like a house because a person No, but if there is owns people it for 20 from years. The, uh, if a condo owner has pools and beers and 15 people over, that goes to Jake. We can't send a lease violation. Right, that goes to Jake. Well, and he sends, to Jake. He sends what's what. applicable. No, what you would do is is we, we have the, the letter that says, you know, you're in violation of the ground sublease. Mm -hmm. And so it's like with that that we would we would let them know and that would be a conversation as far as when we would there's a procedure and it's like you would send a certified letter to them and it's like when it when it ends up happening um, with with non payment of can fees, potentially it could, you know, result in in your um, property being taken back by the ground sublease for non-conformance to the ground sublease. That that would be the the end game. Are there no fines? Are there no fines? Violations? Fines? I, thought, I kept thinking that there were. Oh, yes. that you can, it says that you can fine up to $100. And so at this point, you know, what this is what this is about is that is that to have the political will of the yeah. of the community yeah, we're very willing to implement it. At the same time, for us to do it, you know, it's like everything else. If, you know, if we do it, it's like, you know, you go by the book and they go, well, we read a different book. And even though it's even even though the book says so that, and it's violation, ground sublease violation with potential fine, with potential fine, but at least the first ground sublease lease violation sounds to me is is it avoided? Well, and the, the and, and basically. And for us, but your own rules also say that you can charge the tenant for a gamut, and you will charge. The I will always charge it. Right, I'm but just saying that's, that's not a fine, but you can charge. I the always mm -hmm. charge the mm -hmm. gamut, right? Yeah. Well, it sounds like there's a little more work to do, but still, um, you know. Yeah, good conversation. Yeah. Thank good. you. Yeah, okay. Okay. Well, and I think I would like to say I would, this conversation. I, I appreciate the timing. I think it's something to keep in keep in mind that it really needs to go out by end of April, yeah. beginning of May, in a you know to have have it for this this swimming season. Yeah. Because this has been I brought this up two years ago. Remember when I showed up yeah. with everybody yes. uh, that I received that was disturbing and stuff um, about the behavior and the action. So this has been something almost like the target. It's 
<laughs> I'm like, oh, crap, you. you're going to ask me about if I could, you know what, If I could just throw some, just some reality out there. I've lived in, in three different condominium associations, and I, and I am the board chair on two commercial condominium projects. And enforcing rules and identifying the people who broke the rules and figuring out what to do and where the gray areas are is just a problem. And it's an ongoing problem that you just, that's why they have judges in this world. Well, the good news is that Ian and Spring is willing to look at the camera. But I do, I would like to, I encourage the community to kind of set up what they want and in, in conjunction with Ian and Spring and, and working with Jake so that they are enforced the way, um, the way everybody who lives here, or the majority of the way people who live here want that to happen. And it's not, and it's not always going to be agreeable to everybody. And, and the condos that you um, manage, do they heat in the winter? Mine no, they do not. I lived at no, they don't. I actually wrote that down. Did one of the things, I mean, we, they, my pool, where I live yeah. right now, the pools, they shut them down in the end of September and they turn them on in early May. Right, that's what you have. But other than during oh. the winter, they just, they're just, if you want to get in there, go ahead. <laughs> but it's Polar cold. Well, people do wear wetsuits. I yeah. mean, those yeah. things that they wear in Vermont and they yeah. exercise. But, um, yeah, anyway, I, I, I don't have much. I, I just, I want to just encourage the conversation to get there. I, I think that the site authority would like to see the community uh, in enforcing the rules the way the community would like to see the rules enforced. And if they, and the, the, the ground sublease is very difficult to change. It's just such a recorded document that was recorded with everybody's deed and, and, it's, and, it, and every way the lender has it, it's difficult to change. The rules and regulations are not, and and those are things that can be discussed. And if, if I mean, I think we even have done a little bit of that. So, I mean, if there's some contentious, if you're if you're feeling Jake like you're uncomfortable with the political, when I hear the word political will, meaning, you know, you think there's going to be some serious backlash if there if, if some of these are enforced. I, I think I think if the community via the HAC or you know uh, comes to the site authority and says. We've discussed these things. We think that the rules should be beefed up here, or we find that the rules haven't been enforced, and 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 historically, we don't know if that's in the site authority's position or if it's just you know a, I think it just hasn't been done. I think the site authority would just like to know that as part of their decision making if we're going to change rules. I guess the, the one question that I would have, you know, being the manager, is I do not know what the liability. Um, overlay on it is. Right. You know, we've been very fortunate there had there has not been an incident. Okay. Oh, right. And right. and so it's like looking at it and going from a liability standpoint, you know, it's like I'm happy you're having a good time. But it's but that I think needs to be the overlay uh, and you look at many of the rules and you go, they this has to do with liabilities. You know, why they why they need to say say those things. Well, that's true. So again, you know, I know one of the things we've talked about is insurance, and I would really love to see perhaps an insurance somebody who could answer those questions because liability questions and about do we want you know what do you need to do to protect yourself from those liabilities? Do we have insurance that protects us from those things? And and where would that insurance not be? Applicable if we if, if we somehow didn't follow through in some way, the fact of the matter is you can't. All you can do is give it that your best efforts, and I think most insurance people will tell you that. So, um, but it would be good to know that and make sure that we are covered for those kinds of things because that's it's a legitimate concern. Well, I happen to have a meeting with them on February oh. 16th. <laughs> <laughs> Great timing. Good girl. Yeah. 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 Like I said. Oversee that piece as well, but it ties in, it ties in beautifully because the coverage for the campus, um, I find coverage for all of our liabilities in addition to the auxiliary. So, meeting with them on the 16th. So, it's usually something like reasonable effort. What's reasonable? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've got a list of things, but I have a specific question. So, no, I don't, but, but I don't, you know, in general, if somebody, somebody, somebody just blatantly violates a rule and hurts themselves, we're not liable. Blatantly violates the rule. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the bag is in the middle of a conversation about budget and reserve funding and yeah. all of those things. And I hope that before the next site authority meeting where some results of those conversations, maybe some eventually will, that we might have something to come forward. My hope is that we'll get there for the February meeting and won't be delayed until the May meeting because I would like to be letting residents know what's happening earlier this year than we were able to do it last year. So in my optimistic view, um, and knowing that I become a pumpkin on the uh, 10th of March uh, uh -oh. again, uh, so, um, you know, I'm going to put in the field and who knows when they're going to cut the vine if they have to sprout, have wheels for my fairy godmother again. Um, but given that, uh, if we could plan a meeting in February that we cancel if we're not ready, I think, but just plan one and sure. know that our basic topic is looking at operating and reserve budgeting and, and what we're recommending that we go forward to with as the topics for that meeting. I don't have any problem with the February meeting. I, I, don't, I don't know what the date would need to be. Um, well, certainly not the 14th. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a Friday anyways. Okay, don't worry, we won't do that stuff. Your Valentine's Day. <laughs> so, uh, Thank you. Uh, Thank so the site is going to be on the 24th. Monday the 24th. Yeah. What? <laughs> so the Thursday before is the 20th. Uh, yeah. Uh, and Jake was suggesting we could potentially move the HSC meeting to Tuesday the 18th. Well, you know, I'm just putting that out there, or, or we could do this meeting on the 18th. Oh, you wanted to do it? We want the well, HSC meeting. We the HSC meeting. So we did that. that so the 18th on the, the 18th for the for the HAC meeting and then the 20th for this meeting. Now let me ask you something, Bill. So it's like if we meet three days, three, four days before the site authority meet, board meeting, the, what does that do? Does that help us or is that being? Well, I think, it, I, I think the, whoever takes the notes for that meeting, I'm gonna be all over there. <coughs> to get them to me and, <laughs> because, and the only problem is is that they will not those minutes will not get into the board packet. Right. Right. So but but the but the content of the meeting will I mean if there's issues there it will be discussed and they those those minutes will follow. So in, in a following meeting. So right. yeah. And it, it gives us an opportunity um, on the twenty fourth if we need to have a broader conversation. Yeah to yeah. have it on the 24th yeah. but it leaves us in a situation where we haven't created something that that we know will, will um, fill the room uh, in ways that we yeah. might not like it to be filled yeah. I appreciate that can I yeah. bring in at a point where I could bring up earthquake insurance again yeah. okay so I know last time we talked about the goal of having an insurance person on the phone for a pet start. Is it Allianz? Um, um, Alliance. 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 Um, <laughs> you had me going. Alliance. Yeah. Because yeah. um, I, th I think it's just really important that we not push it under the rug. No, just, I understand. I met with, um, if I had, I, I was with all of the Alliance folks last week at an auxiliary conference and met with two of the folks from um, that agency. I was actually with system wide and we brought that up again and and she brought it up and said the last time we spoke, Catherine had this where we at I said, Oh, the timing is perfect. So that's part of our conversation on the sixteenth. On the sixteenth of February sixteenth for okay. me to meet with all of our our it's both our system wide and the reliant representatives. Okay. But it's specific yeah. to the auxiliary. Now do we know what they do like um our counterpart in Irvine, I know they're similar to us. I don't know how they handle it. We don't know. I we, don't know. Do we have any way we probably of... Rosa wouldn't. May, um, I'll, I'll, let me check with her. She's off campus I mean, if today you want to know because if they she have asked a lot of questions. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, good one. Interesting question. Yeah, because yeah. I'm kind of, the more I'm thinking yeah. about it, um, 
it, it seems like, I mean, we're on state land and it, it kind of, we're, the community was built basically to, as a, to coexist with the university, right? And so part of their draw for, is to recruit faculty and University Glen is a, is part of the enticement, right? I mean, you've got your category one all the way down to the public stuff. So, I mean, you kind of have to look at it. It's like there's, they're still using in their, in their um, recruiting packet, they still to talk about you, Glenn. And it almost kind of seems like if they're going to bring faculty, and I'm not faculty, so, but I'm just saying from perspective of the connection between the university and you, Glenn, is that you want to protect the, their investment, you know, if, if their faculty is going to buy. Can you imagine if we have a horrible earthquake and then the faculty that has been brought here and doesn't have a school to teach. And doesn't, <laughs> well, I think right. that might be a little sturdy. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, yeah. the, well, the classrooms in this building we sit in does not have earthquake. It has that umbrella yeah, we have well, emergency. Well, exactly. exactly. But it, it does, so so the right. condos right now have the same coverage as the, the building university. we're sitting in right now. And, and that is, what is that called again? The, I think Catherine well, talked about that. Yeah, it's 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 a general law, but it's an oh, umbrella policy. It's it's. I have to find it. I've got the rebuilding. It just no, covers no. the so, so, I, I would really like like we've had people come here and make presentations to this to this group, and it would be to to I think to our to this group's benefit to have someone address the insurance issue because I know I know personally that it's not quite as as simple. It's it's what's covered and what the cost is and what the and what the um, the deductible is and all of those kinds of things. And and until you really have all of those components and really know what you're going to get for your money, it's easy to say I want earthquake insurance. But if you were given all of the information that had to do with it, you might say, well, maybe I'll take my chances. But if you but because if you the cost in, might be so much that you'll say I don't want to pay that. But much if money. you were in Sherman Oaks when they in the ninety four earthquake, when that's when it kind of came to light that these condo complexes didn't have insurance, I'm sure those people retroactively were thinking, I wish I would have paid. Well, right? well so, they I mean, do, I think well, we but, there are, but there are knowledge. other homeowners associations who've right. been given the opportunity to have it, and once they see the cost and what it's going to do to their dues, I they, they vote it down. So that's something that, yeah. here's my thinking, and just, just my personal opinion. I think that it would be nice for us to have good information sure. so that we're educated about what is available, an idea of what the costs are, and then at some point, it's not. I mean, I guess the site authority could just say, "Okay, we're getting it, and it's and your and your dues are going to go," <coughs> or you're going to ask the community what what you know, and the HAC is going to kind of talk about how that how that works. But and I that think only that only affects the well, town homes. It's not the it's not the homes that suffer. Well, because the homeowners can decide whether they want. I got my own insurance. I live yeah. here. I have a home. I wanted insurance. Right. I went to the farmers. So, so um, when I, I get on the ranch, I the insurance that I could get there would not cover the brick on my house right, right. or the chimneys and this and the other. But but that's different since you're at home. So we're relying upon the site authority that's or right. that to uh, cover the outside. The one thing to think about is like I have earthquake insurance and I want to talk to my agent to see if it makes sense of even having it, being that. The university doesn't have the. Right. I haven't had a chance, and, but I will. And I, and I have but, been for earthquake insurance. But, but the thing is, better educated. But what, what's nice yeah. about in that policy that I have the earthquake, you can get it. You pay a little bit extra, and then it covers your assessment, the assessment that they would. Uh, yeah. That well, yeah. So yeah. it could be that that we could talk and have the well, conversation. Well, you're going to have to have both. Right. No, no, no. Yeah. I know, but yeah. it could be that each person then uh, has to have their own and then has it so that it covers their assessment that takes care of some of the sting of if you have it. I'm just saying it, I, I just right. want to keep it on the table. No, I know, again, Thank you. again, I think it's a matter of just being educated so that you can make a decision. Right now, we don't know, none of us know what that cost would be and what would be covered and, and what wouldn't be covered. And 
Um, the DNS rate very very good insurance on your on your house on your apartments. They don't, I don't know. They don't tell me all their insurance details. You're you're certain, Tom? Uh, I have a feeling that they. I don't. asked Ben Gordon. And oh, he said they do. Okay. Right. So kind of a blanket okay. coverage they have for all their properties. Okay. Yeah. One of the, one of the specific questions. Clarify. It's not so much individual homes. It's what you can pick yeah. up. It's the streets and the sidewalks and right. everything right. that diverts the homes. And when you hit your lump sum of $20 million, your priority is, you know, open up the classrooms again or something. And when does when do things get fixed up there that well, may affect our but we can't cover that, with our that can be that, that might be again, again, again those are all things that you need to know before you make that decision. Because the same thing would happen. Come and talk with people you know are just Right. The, 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 the city. The city. Yeah. I would, can so I bring up? Were you done with that copy? I just want one more FYI for the site authority. Mm -hmm. um, a week ago or so, I went over to the county because they would pass the moratorium on the hemp production. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And when I, I saw this in the newspaper on Monday, the hearing was on Tuesday, and I looked at the map, these were not included as an area around which a buffer would be drawn. And we would arguably, even if the moratorium and regulations were adopted, it would be not affected not prohibit hemp right up against Lewis Road. And, but didn't it yeah. say so many, uh, excuse me. Exactly. Because the county ag commissioner was relying on the county general plan and okay. he was saying, you know, you had to be an incorporated city or a recognized urbanized area. And on the general plan, this whole complex, including the houses, just says state facilities. That's all it says. Um, so they did not draw an idea. Mm -hmm. So I went and, and um, uh, Linda Park's office immediately understood and they added it in. But had I not seen that or somebody else, um, so sometimes the relationship between this campus and us and the houses and the county is messy, <laughs> detail-wise. Well, we need to be aware of it, yes. Yeah, so that some, somebody kind of knows, like right. the county's adopting a new general plan right. and, and I think we're still designated site, site Right, right. Well, there's benefits to yeah. that, and, there's and there is disadvantages. Yeah. Yes. No, I just bring that up. Well, thank you. So we did get incorporated, and it should yeah, well, hopefully you, stop the hemp. Smell. Thank you, Chris. Right. <laughs> so, do we have anything else to discuss? Okay. Then our meeting is adjourned, and we will have our next meeting on Thursday. 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 Thursday.